you know, tonight is the beginning of the, the new month of Tammuz from the new moon. I don't know if you know this, but you can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. Now, what do the scriptures have to say about eclipses? In Genesis 1.14, everyone knows, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. Okay, the number one reason God made the sun and the moon was for what? Now, see, this proves the existence of God because what are the odds that we would live on a planet that has a moon going around it that's at the right angle from the sun, the right dimensions to even have an eclipse. It's so astronomical, they can't even determine the odds of there being an eclipse because it's so mathematical how everything has to work. But we just read in Genesis, God created the sun and the moon for... And look at Luke 21, 25, 26. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth, the anxiety of nations, in perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear, and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. So let's see, does that make sense? He created the sun and the moon for signs, and so there's going to be signs when the Messiah comes in the sun and the moon. That's pretty simple, right? But look at this. Why does he say that? Look at Luke 21, 28. The next verse says this. And when all these things begin to happen, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Hello. Look up and lift your heads because what is near? Wow. That, that doesn't mean the redemption is going to happen on the day of an eclipse. This is just saying when all these different things are happening, we need to look up. Because these are signs that we are near our redemption. Look at Romans 13, 10 through 12. It says, love doesn't harm a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Doing this, knowing the time, it is already time for you to wake out of your sleep. For salvation is now nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us therefore throw off the works of darkness and let's put on the armor of light. So if we know the times, we're to wake out of sleep. Just like in Luke 21, redemption is near. It says your salvation is now nearer than when we first believe. Well, if this was 2,000 years ago, how many believe we're really close now? Yeah. Hello. But now look at Luke 21, what it goes on to say then in verse 31 and 32. Even so, you also, when you see these things happening, what? The sign and the sun and the moon and the stars, know that the kingdom of God is near. Most certainly, I will tell you, it is this generation that will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. Now, here's what is fascinating, too, that at the birth of Isaiah 66 of the nation of Israel, there were signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. There were four blood moons, total lunar eclipses when Israel became a nation. This is tying the signs in the heavens to the birth of the nation of Israel that we read in Isaiah 66. Now, how long is a generation? That is the question. But let's look at something. In Luke 21... Let's go on. Keep reading Luke. Verse 34 through 36, it says, So be careful, or your hearts will be loaded down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that day will come on you suddenly. It'll come as a snare on all those who dwell on the surface of the earth. Therefore, we're to be watchful at all times, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Who wants to escape them? I'll, I'll take escape. I mean, if he wants me to go through it, I'll go. But if he thinks I'm crazy, that's fine. I'll go. So then he says, uh, and to stand before the Son of Man. How many want to stand before the Son of Man? Okay. Now, here's my question. What are the mathematical odds that the moon and the sun would appear to be nearly the same size from Earth? I mean, what are the mathematical odds that the sun and the moon, I mean, if they were different sizes than they are now, it would be hard to have an eclipse number one. 
but nobody knows it's so astronomical. But I want to show you some slides here for a moment. I don't know how, I'm going to give you some basic science. The moon can appear large or small depending on where it is. The uh, apogee means far away and perigee means close. So let me show you this slide. The moon's orbit is elliptical, like an egg. It is not always close. When it's at its closest point, it's called the perigee. When it's at its furthest away point, it's called an apogee. Okay, does everyone got that? Because it's elliptical. Now, of course, the Earth is traveling all the way around the sun every year, right? The front and the back. So a solar eclipse happens when the moon comes between the Earth and the sun. Now, if the moon is at its closest point between the moon and the sun versus if the sun's on the other side or if the moon is going around the other side and the Earth, where it's at its furthest away point, it's going to look different. Just like if you hold your thumb up, you can block the whole sun out with your thumb because you're holding it this close. But if you hold it further away, you can see more of the sun. You following me? This is why you can have an annular eclipse. If you have an annular eclipse where the moon doesn't totally blot out the sun, it's because it's, a, it's apogee. It's further away. You have a total eclipse if it's at perigee and it's real close. Does everyone follow me? Okay, I want to make sure everyone understands. But now, when you think about this, what are the odds that the ratio of the size and the distance would be so perfect. They say when you read NASA, the angle even of the eclipse has to be so mathematically precise or it won't even happen. So this tells you God has ordained all of this. But here's an article written by NASA and some other places. Oops, let me go here. Okay, look at what it says. The sun and the moon appear the same size in Earth's sky. Why? It says because the sun's diameter is about 400 times greater but guess what else? The sun is also about 400 times farther away. You see the math? Okay. Now, look at this bottom thing. The distance to the moon from the solar system exploration NASA, the distance to the moon is 10 times the circumference of the Earth or approximately how many kilometers? Not miles. This is in kilometers. Okay. So let's take a look at some facts. The sun is 400 times further from the earth than the moon. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon. And because of that, we can have an eclipse that God created as signs. Which is why we come to the letter Tav, which means a sign or a mark, and its numerical value is 400. Do you get it? Isn't that incredible? The very Hebrew letter that means a mark or a sign has a Hebraic numerical value of 400. And the earth and the moon that are created for signs is 400 times larger than the moon, 400 times further from the earth, 400,000 kilometers away. Do you think there's any coincidence in that? I, got that, I had that aha moment uh, yesterday or the day before. Okay. So in biblical terms, what does a solar eclipse mean specifically, if anything? From a biblical point of view, we read that a solar eclipse can be a sign from God. Now, I don't think it's a solar eclipse are always signs from God. I think it depends on when they fall on the biblical calendar, where they occur. That is what makes us stop and take notice. The neat thing about eclipses is it's beyond any man's control or manipulation. All right? Solar eclipses become prophetically significant and relevant when we understand their timing according to the biblical calendar and where they happen. And then what do we do? We look for the patterns that are tied to the historical events. Now, just as the sun is larger than the moon, the sun represents the nations of the world as the world follows the sun for their calendar. The moon represents the nation of Israel as their calendar months are based on the cycle of the moon. Now, not every solar eclipse is a sign from God, okay? But God uses solar eclipses as warnings to the nations whose paths they cross 
with the prophetic significance heightened when, based on when they fall on the biblical calendar. Is everyone following me? Okay, so now I want to show you some biblical as well as historical patterns. Many of you know the story of Jonah and Nineveh, right? But many do not know the historical background events as to what already happened three years before Jonah came. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you why they repented. It just tells you they repented. We think it was just because Jonah said repent. What are the chances of Iran repenting if the Pope goes over there and says repent? It's not happening. Okay, so the Assyrians hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Assyrians. They took half the, most of Israel, the 12 tri or 10 of the 12 tribes into captivity. They hated each other, which is why Jonah didn't want to go. Okay, just like you wouldn't want to go to Syria or North Korea or Iran. All right, so there was some background historical facts that they found in archaeological finds in Assyrian cuneiform tablets. So I'm going to tell you what happened prior to Jonah coming which is you're going to, it's like the Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. In 765 BC, a plague broke out in Nineveh. It was so bad, even the king wasn't able to go out to war in the spring, as was the custom. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. Okay, all of this is confirmed in these uh, tablets that were found in the 19th century. Now, guess what else happened? You have a plague, civil war, plague, then you have a very famous solar eclipse called uh, the Bersagel Eclipse, and it was in 763 BC. The red arrow points to what is now modern Mosul, which was then Nineveh. That was, you heard of our soldiers being in Mosul, okay? That's Nineveh. And this total solar eclipse goes right over Nineveh. So here they have plague, civil war, plague, total solar eclipse, and then here comes Jonah. Hey, you guys, you better repent or God's coming to get you. Okay, we give up. So these are the things that had happened. Uh, so now the Ninevites saw the wrath of God closing in on them uh, before Jonah even arrived. A couple, this was a couple months later Jonah arrived because Jonah arrives on the first day of the month of Elul, which is 40 days before Yom Kippur. He's telling them they have 40 days to repent. This is on the biblical calendar. The first of Elul is very significant. Okay, so this eclipse happens about two months before Jonah arrives on the first of the law saying you have 40 days to repent. And he's waiting to Yom Kippur to see if judgment is fallen. He gets in the sukkah in Nineveh watching to see if God's going to judge them. Okay, so how many of you know God knows how to use the sun and the moon for signs? All right. As a matter of fact, the first of Elul is not only when Jonah began prophesying for 40 days, it's also the very day that John the Baptist was immersing everybody and immersing Yeshua who went for 40 days into the wilderness. It's also the same 40 day time frame, the first of Elul, when Moses went up the second time to get the second set of the commandments coming down on Yom Kippur. The first of Elul is very significant. It has to do with you better repent. Does everyone see that from... Moses, the golden calf incident, Jonah, Nineveh, Yeshua, 40 days in the wilderness. Okay. Now, the month of Elul is known as the month of repentance and preparing for the 10 days of awe. And what did John the Baptist say? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, because he's coming. Yom Kippur, the day of judgment. All right, so now let's look at another historical pattern. All right, this is a map of the Ottoman Empire. How many heard of the Ottoman Empire? That was around for about 400 years or something like that until World War I, it was destroyed. It is said that World War I lasted about four years. You can Google this and it says roughly from August 1st of 1914 until November 11th of 1918. Okay, those are the dates. But do you know, here they say it began on August 1st of 1914, but do you know three weeks later, on August 21st in 1914, there was a total solar eclipse with the path of totality going directly over Eastern Europe and the Ottoman Empire, including Nineveh. 
This was the sign of Eastern Europe's involvement and the coming destruction of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. So you see the judgment on the nations, total solar eclipse going through Eastern Europe, going through Turkey, going through Iraq, right where Nineveh is and Iran. And what do we have? We have World War I. And then and also notice August 21st. When is the solar eclipse this year? Okay. August 21st, 2017. Okay, now we know the solar eclipse back then, we saw a, a world war take place. Okay, now, I don't know if you guys know this, but August 21st, both times, is at the first of a lull. The warning of repentance before judgment comes. Now, let's see. I don't know if you knew this, but on April 6th of 1917, that is when the U.S. entered World War I. Okay, August, April 6th of 1917. So this year, 1917, this last April, was the 100th anniversary. But I don't know if you knew this. Do you know on June 6th, of 1918, there was the Battle of Below Wood that involved the U.S. Second Infantry Division. That's when it began. And it was during the three-week fight against the Germans that the Americans experienced their first significant battlefield casualty with 5,000 people killed. So this is America's first major casualty uh, in World War I on June 6, 1918. Well, did you know on June 8, 1918, there was a total solar eclipse going across the United States that was almost identical to the pattern that we're having on August 21st? Okay, and so here we see America gets involved with World War I, and we also have a total solar eclipse across America, and it was 100 years ago that was the last time we had a total solar eclipse across the United States. All right, now, where am I at? Okay. So, after almost 100 years, this August 21st, we will again have a total solar eclipse going over the United States. This is again at the beginning of the month of repentance on the first of Elul. Could God be giving us a warning that we need to repent just as Nineveh or judgment will be coming to the United States? The timing could not be clearer. And here's what's amazing to me is it doesn't mean war is going to come. It means we need to repent. And just as Nineveh was spared, we could be spared. But I believe these are signs in the heavens that God is telling us by looking at the pattern of when it falls, where it occurs, we need to be praying. And here is the path of that eclipse coming August 21st as it goes all the way through from Oregon down through South Carolina. But you'll, I, I stopped it in this video right by St. Louis. And the reason why... I don't know if you knew it, but exactly about seven years later, there's going to be another total solar eclipse across the United States. But this time, it's going from the south to the northeast. And what's crazy, St. Louis is in the crosshairs of the two. Okay? Now, why is April 8th significant? April 8th is the first of Nisan. That's the day of the beginning of the biblical year. That is when the fire fell from heaven. That's when the Moses tabernacle was dedicated. And so you can see this X or this cross right through, and it's exactly seven years later. Now, here's what's amazing also <clears throat> is this. This is the ancient letter Tav which looks just like the X going across the United States, which is a sign from God. Okay? Now, that's not all. <laughs> Are you ready for a little bit more? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm already over about three minutes. Can I give me five more minutes? Five more minutes. Another, after this warning of this total solar eclipse, a month warning to prepare and make straight the way of the Lord, right? We come to the fall feast. 
there's another very significant sign in the heavens that follows a month later, and it happens coincidentally between the days of awe from Rosh Hashanah on Tishri 1 to Yom Kippur on Tishri 10. There's going to be kind of like a confirmation of celestial events as described in the book of Revelation chapter 12. In verse 1 and 2, it talks about there being a great sign being seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child. She cried out in pain, laboring to give birth. Okay, well, here's the constellation Virgo. The constellation Leo, which is the lion representing the tribe of Judah, has nine main stars in it. And here you can see, uh, right here, she's clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. But I want, you to, I want to point out a couple of facts. Almost every year, Virgo is clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet around Rosh Hashanah. That is normal. Okay? And then you have these nine stars of Leo. But in Revelation 12, it mentions on her head was a crown of what? Twelve stars, which represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? Now, but what's amazing is this. There are three planets that are coming through, which has never happened before in history, at this same time, giving her a crown of 12 stars. Now, some people say, well, you can't see it because you can't see this when there's the bright sun out. Well, no one Revelation, nowhere in Revelation 12 does it say you're going to see it. It says John saw it. We're just supposed to be informed that it's going to happen. You're never going to see both the sun and the moon and the stars at the same time. That was obvious. That wasn't the point of God telling this. It was so that we would at least be aware of when it would happen because at least we have the technology now to know it. Okay, so let me go back to this. Now, then you all know Revelation 12 talking about uh, the birth of the man child, right? Now, here's what's interesting. When it comes to the Bible, the Torah, uh, Michelle Schneeberger sent me this uh, little link the other day. Uh, talking about the number 70, and it's from a Jewish source. Listen to what they say, and you guys already know this, but it says the number 70 is very critical in the turning points of history. After the flood, there were 70 nations that descended from Noah. 70 languages emerged at the building of the Tower of Babel. The Jewish nation began with the 70 people who came with Jacob to Egypt. In the world to come, the 70 prime nations will recognize God as the one and only ruler of the world. Zechariah 14, all nations come. They slew 70 bulls for the 70 nations. Well, so the number 70 is very significant. Well, get a load of this. Psalms 20 is read every single morning by religious Jews after their morning prayers. Why is Psalm 20 read? Because there are 70 Hebrew words. And they say this corresponds to the 70 years of travail and suffering referred to in the classic text as the birth pangs of the Messiah. So they see the birth pangs of the Messiah lasting 70 years. We see the seven-year tribulation, but they say the birth pangs take place over 70 years, with the natural birth being 1948. And at that began, the birth pangs of the man-child were now at the 70th year of 1948, 2018. Okay? Uh, so this, this image in the heavens is pointing to 2018. Okay? And listen to what it says here. Psalms 20, verse 1 through 9, it also talks about, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The day of trouble is referring to Jacob's trouble. They know the psalm has to do with the tribulation, the birth pangs of Messiah, so they read it every day that the Lord would answer them. And it goes on to say, and this is the verse you all know, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Okay, and I believe these are signs in the heavens for us to look up. Keeping our eye on Israel as events unfold with the 70th anniversary of their birth as a nation next year in 2018. And I believe this next year and a half will be times of great revelation for those who have an understanding of the times. Uh, may we all merit to see the messianic era when all 70 nations of the world will unite as one with the Jewish people under one Torah and under one God. 
And as I stated in uh, my book, The Blood Moons, which I think is still very relevant today, these are all signs in the heavens pointing to what is coming, and I believe especially next year, the 70th anniversary, uh, that these are God inserting himself into human history as prophecy becomes fulfilled as never before. So we need to look up. Amen? Uh, one of the uh, exciting things is this is what I spoke about uh, that's coming out on DirecTV uh, this fall. I went down to California. Uh, we talked about this along with some other people. Uh, and so that will be three different TV series coming out on DirecTV this fall. We'll let you know when. But anyway, so look up. Amen? And let's stand up. <laughs> Thank you.